Ascendancy deck, which had the combo in it, was more of a tokens build. Yuya and now Shane are playing this deck where they just took the combo out of it all together. It's just a tokens deck with... You're playing Jeskai Ascendancy just as a good card. Yeah, it's just for value. And I like that philosophy a lot because once you have Ascendancy in play, it's not like you need to actually go infinite to win the game most of the time. Just Ascendancy plus some tokens will get it done. As much as it pains me to say it, I also think it's correct to move, remove the combo, though it kind of makes me want to play the deck less. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, we are underway. Greg starting on a pair of mountains. No plays just yet. Um, what I like about the Jeskai Tokens deck is instead of playing cards like Retraction Helix, you found room for four treasure crews. Just good stuff uh, and, and yeah. no moving parts, which is really nice. That's actually something we saw this week in both Modern and Standard is a lot of players... Jeskai Ascendancy was originally this combo piece, right? And we saw players in both formats more or less play it in a shell of good spells, saying, hey, this card is good enough where we don't... You don't have to build around it to get its value. It'll just be good no matter what you do with it. And this is the kind of matchup where I think the Jeskai Tokens build really shines versus builds with the combo. Greg's going to put Shane under a lot of pressure in this matchup. He's got a fair amount of removal. And setting up Springly Drum plus Creatures Untap plus a Retraction Helix and not getting a guy killed in response, that's really tough. But Shane can simply block all day long, trade off, get value off of the Ascendancy, and then take the game over with things like Seeker of the Way and Chandra Pyromaster. It doesn't actually need to go infinite to be able to stabilize against Greg. So to recap here, Greg's first play of the game was a turn three Hordling Outburst. So a little slow for his aggro deck. Shane had a turn two Raise the Alarm into a turn three Jeskai Ascendancy. Remember with Ascendancy, you have to take a turn off to play it, but after that, your game gets really powerful. Yes. And we'll see that happen right here. Greg is going to cast Goblin Rabble Master. We'll see if it's pre or post combat. It is pre. Four goblins swinging in. Will Shane make any blocks? We'll see here in a sec. Probably not, would be my guess. Klein to agree. His tokens get so much better going forwards, going forward after this turn, and Greg's tokens pretty much are what they are. Now, if Shane thinks he has inevitability, if he's going to win the game regardless if it goes on for a long time because of ascendancy, then he can block here and just give up a little bit of percentage now to ensure that down the line things run smoothly. Yeah, he does make the trade. If you look at the rest of Shane's hand, he has two more lands, Chandra Pyromaster, Hordling Outburst, Jeskai Ascendancy, and Seeker of the Way. So a lot of options here. And when you're playing against someone who's playing all mountains, I'm a little more inclined to trades. So I think I like Shane's play there just because I don't have confidence that my opponent's deck has a good late game. Exactly. Especially in the face of your ascendancy. Yeah. Even just drawing and discarding, and you know, Shane's hand is going to get a lot better over time. Yeah, it just doesn't take much to win a late game against an all mountain deck typically. See there. A loot here. He draws his copy of Stoke the Flames. Discards his second Jeskai Ascendancy. And that's one of the benefits of normalizing this deck like this. If he's able to stabilize the board, even Chandra will be good enough to win the game. Yeah. So you don't have to go infinite to be able to win. See, and see what Greg's draws are. You're absolutely right, though, with these red decks. You almost kind of feel like every mountain Greg draws from here on out is just a stone blank. Yeah. I'm not even really happy to have four mountains in play. In the old version, in the, so for example, the mono red list that I was playing with last year, you had four copies of Mutavault, so that's a nice little hedge. And you also had a couple copies of Mizium Mortars, which didn't come up all the time, but there would be some games where, you know, you would randomly get to six lands and overload of mortars, and that's very powerful. The current standard builds of Mono Red have no analog to either of those cards. So, yeah. when you, as you mentioned, when you get land number four, when you get land number five, it's really hard to convert those into anything useful. And how do you feel? There's no temples in Greg's list. He did have the option to play them. He's on all basics. Uh, I think that this deck is game one. If you're playing this deck, it's all because you think people's decks are too slow and you're pushing them out of the gates. I would not mess around with temples in game one. If you want to play temples, there's way more powerful decks you have access to in this format that you can go to. Temples isn't going to give this deck a reasonable late game. Yeah, also not enough. Also, to put to be blunt, when your cards stink objectively, it's not that helpful to be scrying. You're not. It's not like you're going to find this great oh, card. Sweet, oh. I put a Swiss spear on the bottom of my deck, and now I drew a Valley Dasher. Now this is great. That's not. That's not really. Yeah, how that that's works. a good point. <laughs> you're better off just curving out. Uh, if you have more burn spells, then it does get better, right? Yes, yes, for sure. 
If you have Stoke and Jeskai Charm, imagine a world where Jeskai Charm could fit into Modern Red deck. Then that's a great incentive to scry. See a swing here from Greg. Just a single block from Shane, looks like, on the Rabble Master. Yeah, just a chump here, trying to leave his tokens in play. Yeah, it's probably, he had the option to kill the Rabble Master, and I was a little surprised he wouldn't do it. Well, well Shane might feel like, he, again, his tokens with an Ascendancy in play are just worth a lot more than Greg's. But now with that third Horling Outburst, it's possible Shane just gets pushed out of this game before he's able to leverage much out of the Ascendancy. Yeah, it's second Horling Outburst from Greg. He had, Shane had his own, but you're right, Greg now with six Goblins in play. It's four from Horling Outburst, two from Rabble Master. Two more from Hardling Outburst traded early on. Seeker of the Way from Shane. He's going to leave up some mana. And now Greg's got to be worried about Shane casting any non-creature spell here. Well, it requires two. If, it's, if, if Greg has stoked the flames, it requires two spells because a Tendency plus Prowess still leaves it at a 4-4, four, four, assuming Shane has one. So I, I like Greg going for it here. This is super efficient. And Shane has to have a pretty unrealistic hand. Yeah. It's, it's something, you know, like two magma, two magma sprays or something. He's going to go for Stoke the Flames on the Rabble Master in response to Greg Stoke the Flames. And he's going to see if he can loot into another non-creature spell, possibly. He finds Jeskai Charm. That's not going to do it. And actually, this timing on Shane's side is kind of problematic because it means that now his tokens will trade instead of eating Greg's tokens. Unless there was a one-mana spell he was drawing to, I, I think that Shane probably just needed to let that happen. Exactly. Right, because now, if he'd done it on Greg's turn, he could eat two attackers here. And, and Shane's falling behind on the board, and, you know, this is now rock in a hard place territory, and now it's getting even worse. Searing blood on one of the tokens. Shane will lose a blocker, go to 11, take, take damage off the searing blood, go to 10. Now some attacks are going to shoot him down to possibly four. And now, you, you're looking at Shane's hand here. If he... If he blocks, then that's pretty bad, because now his ascendancy is not worth very much. If he wants to try to block next turn, it means he has to leave up Jeskai Charm, so he has an instant to trigger the ascendancy on Greg's turn. And in that case, you know, uh, that's probably not enough to, to hold off Greg's army at this point. Yeah, swing of six. Does Shane want to trade one of these away? He, it almost seems like he has to. But whether he does it now or later, that trade's going to happen. Exactly. If he blocks now, he goes to five. He can untap and... Okay, then this is just lethal. I, Greg's going to Titan Strength, one of the unblocked ones. It's not lethal. No, not lethal, but it's, it's pretty bad. Shane's going to drop to two here. Greg's going to get a scry. He's Titan Strengthing one of the unblocked ones, letting the trade happen. Exactly. So uh, the block from Shane here allowed him potentially to play Chandra next turn and fall to one. <laughs> And maybe have a chance to stabilize, but Greg's pump spells are too much to overcome here. And game one goes over to the mono red aggro deck of Greg Hatch. And very impressive performance there from Greg's deck that missed on turn one, missed on turn two against Ascendancy. But you can see the power of Horling Outburst in matchups where people are playing with one for one removal spells. When you're not looking at Arc Lightnings or Anger of the Gods, it, it's just hard to beat that card with, with Lightning Strikes and Magma Jets, obviously. And, and that's yeah. what Greg was able to do that game. And if I want to go back, it, it does seem like... I wonder if Shane, Shane had an opportunity to kill that Rabble Master right away. Just, Greg did net a lot of free cards off that. But you're right, he, just may, he basically just played a couple Hordling Outbursts, and that, that did it. It's possible Shane didn't have enough respect for what Greg's deck was capable of there, because Greg came out of the, de out of the gates really slow, and, and it looked like Shane was going to be easily able to win on the back of his Ascendancy. Shane kind of took some disconnected lines in terms of, well, this turn I'm going to be chump blocking, this turn I'm going to trade off, this turn I'm not going to block at all to try to build up my board and, and let Ascendancy do his thing. And uh, Greg was able to steal it. All right, well, these guys going to get ready for the sideboard here. I want to talk a little bit about Star City Games game night. If you notice the pins we're wearing here, we have switched over to December. This is now the turtle pin, which you can win at game night to get one of these turtle tokens. Its name's turtle, but it's a beast token. You see it over there on the left. Game night happens every week in December. Ask your store about running StarCitiesGames.com game night. It can be any of your weekly tournaments at the store. It becomes a Star City Games game night. Uh, tokens and pins go to the winner throughout that month. Exactly. You can run the tournaments sanctioned, non-sanctioned, any format that you want, any day of the week that you want. Just get players into your store for some fun and friendly magic. Too late, of course, to get on board with the December kit, which you see in front of us and the pins that we have on this weekend. But if you want to get 
uh, your store involved for January. Head over to StarCityGames.com slash Game Night for more information or contact your Star City Games organized play representative. All right. So let's look at the sideboard here. Generally, people can have good sideboards against a mono red deck. Uh, what's Shane got for us? So Shane has, uh, this is the Yuya's kind of conversion sideboard, which is really potent in this matchup. Two Erase, two Glare of Heresy, and Elspeth, two Magma Spray, two Anger of the God, two End Hostilities, four Disdainful Stroke. I think this is a really easy uh, sideboard here of End Hostilities, Anger of the Gods, Magma Spray, and probably the Elspeth. Getting rid of some of the chunkier removal spells, which aren't very good against Greg's tokens and cheap threats. So things like Stoke the Flames leaves as a card. Um, how do you feel Jeskai Charm, maybe not particularly strong? I think those are the ones that stand out to me. I think four copies of Treasure Cruise is probably excessive in this kind of matchup. I'd probably go down to two or three of those, but some of the less smooth removal spells, I think, are the ones that got to go here because as long as Shane can get it out of the first couple turns without too much damage getting done, he should be just fine. Yeah. Now Especially what with Anger of the Gods and Hostilities in his deck. I'm interested in Greg's sideboard here, and this is a take which I'd be interested in to know what you think of it. There are arguments to boarding in every card in his sideboard here. So he starts out by having a sideboard plan of just good against certain kinds of decks. Three Barrage of Boulders, two Searing Blood. He certainly could go that plan against Shane. Just playing, playing Jeskai Tokens, Barrage should be good. It deals one to each creature that Shane controls. Searing Blood is great against Seeker of the Way. But he also has a different sideboard, and this is a go big sideboard. He boards in two Temples, two Sarkon Dragon Speakers, a Storm Breath Dragon, three Chandra Pyromasters, and then two peak eruption against a red deck. And that also seems like it could be decent against the Jeskai deck. I, I don't know if you can do both of them side by side. That's an awful lot of sideboard cards. What do you think he does? The biggest problem with peak eruption is that there just aren't that many mounds in this list. I think in the old, you know, if you go back to last year's standard format, you can be pretty sure that the three color decks, you know, in this case, they would have some steam vents or some sacred boundaries in them. Right. But in this world, it's just, you know, the it's the M15 dual lands, it's temples, there's really not that many targets for peak eruption. So I imagine that's just for Chain to the Rocks matchups, where you know, if you see that card, you know they have enough, enough mountains to, to yeah. justify peak eruption. You're right, there's actually only two mountains in Shane's deck. So he can't do that. But there is this go big plan, right? Board in two temples, board in storm breaths, sarcans. Um, do you like that, or do you just like Searing Blood, Barrage of Boulders, get better at attacking? I definitely like the two Searing Bloods. Those come in no matter what, because even if Shane gets rid of is his smaller creatures, which is almost impossible. He's still going to have some tokens. And, and even though Searing Blood isn't great there, it's still good enough. I do like going big here just because you have to respect the possibility of sweepers out of your opponent's deck. Even if Greg isn't familiar exactly with this list, if he's not familiar with Yuya's performance, he's still probably aware that these decks have the possibility of siding into Anger of the Gods and in hostilities. I don't think you want to lean entirely on your beatdown package, especially when you're on the draw. So I think for this game, he's going to want to bring in the Planeswalkers. I would not touch Barrage of Boulders because I think Greg has to win the fight over removal, not about the board getting built up. So here's something I want to ask then. If he's boarded, put three Barrage of Boulders in his sideboard, what do you think they're there for? He still might bring him here. Uh, right? Maybe it's still good enough. I, I, they're much more attracted to me on the play than on the draw. Yeah, I agree that I'm not sure they're good here, but I'm, I'm assuming that Greg's not just playing this deck in the dark. He's practiced it. And if he likes Barrage, I have to think it's for this matchup. It could be both. I think Greg is probably somewhat theory crafting and somewhat has some games under his belt, but... You're probably right that they're coming in and they're probably for this matchup, but I think, you know, if Shane is going with this go big, anger the gods plan, and de-emphasizing his tokens a little bit, they might underperform. Certainly could be possible. See here, Greg on a mulligan. Shane's keeping seven on the play. He's down a game right now. We talked about how Greg was the runner-up at the Invitational last year in Vegas. Uh, we do have, you know, this year's Invitational coming up in just a week, and that's going to have some serious implications for our Players' Championship. We're going to take a look at our leaderboard here. A lot of the players in contention, it looks like their spots aren't going to be too much movement this week. They're kind of trying to lock up those spots going in, into the Invitational. So as you see here, it looks like Kevin Jones is going to be your Season 4 points leader. He has a pretty healthy lead over Ross Miriam to get that spot. So when we're looking at this board, we're effectively looking at the top nine not already qualified. So the trophies next to the names of Chris Van Meter, Tom Ross, Joel Lissette, they're already qualified based on Invitationals and a couple of point seasons. So Kevin Jones looks like he's likely to be the Season 4 point invitee, and then we have eight at-large bids. So you see Ross Miriam, Gerard Fabiano, Logan Mize, Kent Ketter. We move over to the second page. Jeff Hoagland, Jim Davis, Brad Nelson, Stephen Mann. That's where the line 
is currently drawn. And you see the players underneath that. We'll delve into that a little bit later when we have a little bit more time, but that's currently where things stand. All right, Greg did keep on six. Shane on the play has a Mystic Monastery, but Greg starts this time with a one drop. It's Monastery Swift Spear. You see Shane with Seeker of the Way and a Jeskai Ascendancy opting not to play the creature. And it looks like he has some removal in to wait for here. He does have a Raise the Alarm. He's trying to maybe ambush that Swift Spear. This is quite the upgrade of a Raging Goblin. Yeah. <laughs> to, put it, to, to put it lightly. <laughs> Uh, Susser swings in. Shane will actually take that damage and just make two creatures off Raise the Alarm. Yeah, I don't think Shane wants to go for a double block there. Too many things can go wrong. Yeah. Greg shoots a Magma Jet upstairs, then loses both his chain. Yeah, just too many things that would be really bad. Third land for Shane. He's going to play an untapped land. Swings his two creatures, 18 apiece. And he'll go for that turn three Jeskai Ascendancy again. Takes great. Yeah, great with nothing much going on, so this is a good spot to stick it, especially with a board already built up. Last game, it did not do enough work, but we'll see what it can do this game. Swift Spear's going to swing again. It looks like Greg's going to Magma Jet. Shane here to get some extra damage. And Shane's got to be, I think, pretty happy with this turn of events. Greg's not getting more cards onto the board, which means Shane has an opportunity to pull ahead. Well, Shane's going to be leaning very heavily on Seeker the Way in this game, I think, because if Greg's on a burn plan, Shane can't really interact with that, and he may not be able to win the game fast enough. But Seeker is a way, if Greg is on that plan and Shane gets in one good shot with Seeker the Way, uh, it blows up Greg's entire plan, so. Yeah, Greg cannot afford to get hit by lifelink. And the fact that Magma Jet's being used here on not Seeker the way, that's going to be, that bodes well for Shane. At the very least, Seeker will probably draw a burn spell out of Greg if he has it. Oh, for sure. But Greg's already mulliganed, and he's using burn spells on Shane's face, so. Yeah. Looks like that was an end step Magma Jet, actually, yeah. so. We'll see what Greg gets this turn. This is his turn three. Another Monastery Swift Spear, but he's not going to attack with them. It's a pretty gutsy play here. Clearly trying to trap Shane into something. And for Shane, I don't know if he goes for an attack. He, he's probably happy to just trade land drops and pass some turns with Greg. He, as it looks like he has boarded in the control package, you saw his draw for the turn was End Hostilities. But at the same time, he's kept in Stoke the Flames. That's another card in his hand. Yeah, I'm curious to see where he got the space for. Maybe Rabble Master got cut? Yeah, that guy's not particularly strong here, though. But there's a lot of sideboarding that needs to be done, so. Yeah. Temple of Epiphany. So he has his fourth land up. You see another land. It's a land, a stoke, an end hostilities, and a seeker of the way in Shane's hand. He'll just pass the turn. He does have stoke the flames mana up thanks to Convoke. Stoke the Flames, one of those cards, it's, it plays really well with Jeskai Ascendancy. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's... Fordling Outburst, the draw from Shane, that will be great for him. Greg just played a fourth land and passed. He only has three cards here. Yeah, there's this odd staring match where neither player really wants to make the first move here. Uh, Greg got a respect for what Shane can do with all of his mana available and ascendancy in play. And Shane, because he has an and hostilities in his hand, doesn't want to develop his board further and had to blow it all away with hostilities anyway. So now we have this sort of weird staring match. And Yeah, Shane's just going to no, no Seeker of the Way, no Hordling Outburst. He'll just play a fifth land and give Greg back the turn. Greg with land number five. Has he boarded in his five drops, or are these lands as bad as they seem? Let's see, he could have a Stormbreath or a Sarkhan. Those would be the great plays. Sarkhan would be great. Stormbreath, not so much. Stormbreath would eat a Stoke the Flames. Yep. Sarkhan would be great, because also it would play around end hostilities. It would, yeah. It would be the would perfect be. card. It would be the perfect card in the spot. It would trigger Prowess if, if Greg wanted to make an attack with the Swiss Spears. He does have two Sarkhan in the sideboard. 
And Greg going to do a little bit of trying to bait some spells out of Shane's hand. Can he sneak some damage in? It's one Monastery Swift Spear. And it's funny, you might actually see both players just pass here. Yeah, a double block from Shane. Will Greg make a move? He's going to try to prowess. It's going to be, looks like another copy of Magma Jet. Or it's going to be Stoke the Flames. Yeah, he's going to cast Stoke, targeting Shane. That will pump Swift Spear to a 2-3. And this is Greg saying you need to have two spells here to really punish me for this line of play, and I don't think you have it. And what is also suspicious here is Greg did not attack with the Swift Spear and is leaving two mana up. So Shane has to respect the possibility of something like Searing Blood, of something like Magma Jet. So pulling the trigger is a little dangerous. What I actually like from Greg, if you notice there, if you, if you like mind game play, Greg tapped two mana, paused, then tapped to decide for Stoke the Flames. Maybe he has a two mana spell and he decided against it, or he's doing a great job of bluffing a two mana spell. Yeah. So this is good enough here for, for Shane to just say, yep, that, that's fine. I'm not going to get involved in this sort of battle with Greg having mana up. Just cast down hostilities, which he kind of wanted to do anyway to free up his hand and move on with life. Yeah, that's why he didn't try to play that combat trick game last turn. And now Greg, mm. post-combat, gets a Sarkhan. Great sequencing here from Greg. Was able to induce a tap out from Shane, and now... Got Sarkhan by any possible counter spells. Essence Swing and put Shane down to, I believe, 11. Maybe it's lower. It's 7 now. Yeah, 7. And we'll see what Shane can do here. It's going to be Goblin Rabble Master, so he has kept those in. I think that, oh, that is a Rabble Master, yep. He's going to go attack Sarkhan down to four, and he's going to use a Stoke the Flames to finish off Sarkhan. Strong line. Gets a loot. But the way that Greg's left his mana up here, I think that, that Searing Blood is a very real possibility to be in his hand right now. Shane does not have enough life points right now. And it's kind of concerning because he's had the Seeker of the Way in his hand the entire time. He's never gotten to gain any life off. And you were saying that's what needed to happen. Well, the, the awkward thing about it was the end hostilities draw. Because Shane's gameplay there for a couple turns was all about that. As you now see the Searing yeah, Blood Yeah, Searing Blood takes care of Rabble Master. Hordling Outburst from Greg. So he has Shane down to four. He has three goblins. One card in hand. This is a really tight squeeze for, on Shane. Drew a red card of some sort. And the problem here is that Shane has no instance in his hand here. Yeah. He has a Hordling Outburst as his only spell. I believe he has, yep. So make Hordling Outburst. He's going to try to loot. Loots into a flooded strand. That won't help. Yeah, if he found Stoke the Flames there, that would be great because he would have another free spell with all of his creatures and would be able uh, to trigger the he able life link. Yeah, he could play Seeker the way and then trigger the life link. It would be great. I'll see if he, I think he's, he's got to play that Seeker at some point here. He needs life points. We'll start with by swinging with one of the goblin tokens. It's kind of a free attack. And yeah, finally. I mean, yeah. It's free enough, I guess. It's not totally free. It's not on tapping, but... Finally, Seeker of the Way finds his way into the battlefield. Does he Shane end? is at four. Is he dead? Is he going to get burned out? Greg has two cards in hand. One of them is a mountain. I believe the other one's a Hordling Outburst. Remember, Shane does not have any non-creature spells in his hand right now. He can't gain life. His Hordling Outburst is the play from Greg Hatch. This is a huge draw step for Shane. If he's able to find a spell, I think he's got a great shot of winning this game if he... If he misses, he's in a lot of trouble still. Yeah, a non-creature spell of any kind. I believe he found Magma Spray. Or he, I believe he found his non-creature spell. Let's see what it... Yeah, Magma Spray is great just because instants are at a premium right now. You see a swing from Shane. And that is a scary, scary attack if you're Greg Hatch. Yeah. Because you have to think he's, if he, this to me just says he drew the instant. There's no way. If you're Greg, you just put your entire team in front of it. Just it's, everybody. It's reasonable. I, I, I yeah. don't know what it, what's the plan here otherwise. Get it dead. It's got to die. And 
You know Shane's going to gain life, and that's going to be really bad, and that's just what happens. Even if Shane has a removal spell, you still get the Seeker off the table, which is the important thing. So why, why isn't Shane attacking with all his goblins as well? I guess because there's a risk. Uh, I, yeah, I guess it's a freebie for him to attack with all the goblins. That's like eight too. damage. That's yep. not even, that's, that's a big freebie. And you might be able to induce Greg to make an attack. If Greg says no blocks, then he could be like, all right, take some damage. Go. Yeah. Although, to be fair, I actually don't think you do that because then what if Greg draws a, if he draws a burn spell, you just die. If he draws, like, you know, a, a Stoke the Flames, he just goes upstairs with it and you die. You probably still use the Magnus on your own turn just to gain that sure. life. Things are so much safer. But He's, if that's the case, then you are right that he should have definitely attacked with all the tokens. Because if you're using it before your damage is dealt, you know, no matter what Greg does. Well, either way, it still works out pretty well for Shane. He gets to untap his creatures. He takes down five of Greg's creatures. He's, he gains four life, so now it's eight to 16. Shane has an ascendancy and four goblins to Greg's one goblin. Shane's in a good spot. We know one of Greg's two remaining cards is a mountain. I believe the other one is as well. Hordling outburst, the draw for Shane Boyd, and he may just run away with this one now. At eight life, it's gonna be hard for Greg to burn him out, and Jeskai Ascendancy will, will win this game pretty quickly. Yep, Greg fell a little bit short of being able to take over the game before Shane stabilized, and now, you know, Greg's flooded out a little bit, and Shane's draw steps are just so much better. Hordling Outburst is the play, so now all his creatures pump to a 2-2. Two, two. That's eight damage from Shane. Greg goes down to eight. Now, Barrage of Boulders still gives Greg some hope here. Yeah. Shane was... does not have a spell. Monastery Swift Spear, however, is kind of outclassed. Yep. And, you know, if I had to guess here, another see another holding outburst from Shane, and that'll be the game. Uh, it looks like the card that we were, we're wondering what was Shane boarding out to get into this control plan. I think you're right in that the card that was boarded out was a was, uh, treasure cruise. Yeah. But we're still talking about two magma sprays, two angers, and two copies of end hostilities. I think it's Jeskai charms and treasure cruises that were boarded out. Yep, I, I can see that. I agree, Treasure Cruise isn't that appealing here. Well, I, I think that if you're sideboarding into Anger of the Gods plus and Hostilities, that a couple copies of Treasure Cruise are pretty attractive to me. I would probably rather yeah. have those than a couple Jeskai Charms, but it's close. I was wondering whether, you know, whether or not... And I think what the argument was whether or not it's better than Stoke the Flames. And maybe when you have a Jeskai Ascendancy deck, it might just be that Stoke the Flames is just too good to board out. That might be true, but I, I think that the... Based on what I've seen out of Greg's deck, if I'm in Shane's position, I'm taking out the Rabble Masters. You've seen Searing Blood. You've seen Magma Jet. The idea that this card's... You're probably bringing in... You know, we've already seen that in Hostilities. We can safely assume the Anger of the Gods are in the deck as well. There's just too much that can go wrong with that card. It's not a spell. It doesn't trigger your Ascendancy. Are you worried about being able to win the game if you board out those Rabble Masters? One thing about this deck on Shane's side is that without an Ascendancy in play, sometimes the deck can have... It doesn't close very fast. I, yes, that's a concern, but I don't think Rabble Master is alleviating that because yes, okay, yeah, Greg's just so well equipped to handle that card. The Rabble Master is just going to die every time. Yep. And if one of your three Horling Outburst tokens gets hit with a Searing Blood, that's not great for you. But you know, life oh, goes on. That's if fine. If your Rabble yeah. Master is getting hit, that's a disaster. Yeah, it's not because the Rabble Master was so valuable, but it's more because that was your turn. You know, he's he's paying two mana to answer your three drop and three you. That's a there's a tempo matters a lot here. So we'll see how Shane sideboards, but that's the card after seeing Greg's composition in, in game two that uh, I think just has very little chance of being good in the average game. Yeah. So we do see on Greg's side, he has boarded in his two, his Sarkans. Looks like he does have Searing Blood as well. We believe he has Barrage of Boulders, though we haven't seen one yet. Mm -hmm. And that's probably about it, I would think, out of the sideboard. Well... There is, uh, I think there's a uh, definitely an argument for Chandra as well. Because Shane's building up the board with a lot of one toughness. Sure. And if you are worried about Shane being overloaded with sweepers, it's nice to have more planeswalkers to go to. If, yes. you, if you can curve, you know, 
Chandra into Sarkin, for example, then you don't really care about Anger of the Gods and hostilities as much. That also makes a lot of sense. Because on Greg's side, there's some pretty easy cuts here. Like the four Foundry Denizens, I think that are going to be hard <laughs> against the Raise yeah. the Alarm Hordling Outburst deck. It's going to be tough for that card to do very much. I think the four copies of Titan Strength against a deck that has that much instance free removal, they're not necessarily going to be very good. Yeah, and also I think the tokens, once again, make a card like Titan Strength a little less appealing. So there's definitely some easy cuts on Greg's side of the table. And I think being able to go to the Planeswalkers against an opponent with so much removal and so much sweepers is a good line to play. What about Valley Dasher? He's still in, right? I like Valley Dasher on the play. I think on the draw it's really bad. But on the play, I think it's totally fine here. Now, is that a matchup dependent statement you made, or is that just a Valley Dasher statement? It's both. I mean, I think against the Karyatic Corsair decks of the world, it's probably not going to be good, you know, no matter what. <laughs> but in this kind of matchup, yeah. there's not even a guarantee Shane can play two untapped lands over the first two turns of the game. So Valley Dasher is likely to connect once, and good shot it connects a second time, actually, when you're on the play. That's pretty sweet. You know, if Valley Dasher's in your deck, you must want it for some number of matchups. And on the spectrum of Valley Dasher matchups that exist, this feels like one of the better ones to me. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's he. So the problem, I, Valley Dasher makes a lot of really ill-advised attacks. So that's one of his downsides. But I don't think that's going to happen too often here. I think but most, more often than not, even if you had the choice with Valley Dasher, he would be attacking. Yep. You know, there's not like... I remember the situation where it's like, no, Valley Dasher, don't, don't swing into that Corsair of Krufix. That's a bad idea. You know, and then he kills himself. And or they're... you have a Titan Strength, you know? Yeah, it's not so bad. When creatures have to attack, they're really good for bluffing pump spells because you have to attack with them, so no one believes you have the pump spell. Yeah. Your hand is forced. I always say I like playing cards like Valley Dasher because they stop me from misplaying. Yeah, they are. They just take care of themselves. It's why, I, when I play Burn, it's why I think Lava Spike is a better card than Lightning Bolt. No I, I can't. I can't screw it up. Can't trick yourself into bolting a Delver. Doesn't even let you do that. Yeah. You just have to target the player. That was... What is it? I played Modern Burn at a recent tournament. I remember having this moment where my, my pod opponent had... He played this a Birds of Paradise, and he played it off a of base, of basic. And at one point, I, his second land was also a green mana. And I was just like, I have this lightning bolt. I'm like, oh, and I really just want to point it as Birds of Paradise. I'm like, I like announce lightning bolt. And I just like very slowly, I'm like, wait. Uh, and then I eventually pointed at the player. And I'm like, that was really took a lot of discipline to not just kill your Birds of Paradise right there. I really want to just get you off all your colored mana. But it's, you know, I'm like, no, no, don't mess it up. And I was thinking, if that was Lava Spike, like, like I almost misplayed right there. Yep. If it was Lava Spike, then I, I would have. It wouldn't have been the option. Shane fishing for a better six. A lot of people that I respect, they all like this. This build of Ascendancy is the real deal. We've messed around with the combo version for a little while. We've seen kind of the hybrid build of tokens plus the combo. And now we reach the point where the combo is no longer part of the deck. It's just playing Ascendancy as a good card. And that this is the. This is the finish line. Yeah. We've crossed it. I actually like the straight combo build right now with all your mid-range decks moving to Whip of Erebos. I like the, the combo deck. And they're the light on removal, too. Right. They, you know, if, the more they try to beat the other mid-range decks, the worse they'll become against the combo deck. Right. That's definitely true. But against Valley Dasher guy, it's good to have as few moving parts as possible. And you got to be able to be Valley Dasher guy, I too. I would not want to be able to... The combo deck, I would not want to play against Valley Dasher guy. That doesn't sound very good. The mono red aggro deck was always pretty... Matchup was already pretty dicey to begin with. You'd try things like Circle of Flame to try to beat this red deck. Yep. That's, and that's a real... That's not a good card. That's good against... Uh, I mean, I've definitely built decks that could never beat that card. So it's, right. it's good some of the time. But, like, it can go wrong in way too many ways. Like, even this Tokens deck, they play one Jeskai Ascendancy, and you're like, man, my Circle of Flames does... Yeah. Boy, I should have played a blank card. Yeah. Gray has a... Goes Swift Spear into Valley Dasher. You it's, got like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really just a bad card. Like, sometimes the, the second one is very good. If you can resolve yeah. two of them, a lot of decks scoop to that. But... It's like Engineer Plague in a lot of ways. It's, the first one's really good <laughs> against some decks, and the, 
against some classes deck, the first one doesn't do anything, but the second one can be a lock. Right. Yeah, Shane going down to five here. He's keeping. We're on. We're underway. Game three. He does have lands. You see a temple, bread by temple, and a basic island. So he'll get to play magic. If anything, it looks like he has too many. It looks like his hand is stoked just guy charm and some lands. And this is a peculiar hand in that I can't figure out what his board plan is off this hand. These are cards that I wouldn't have thought would be in this deck anymore. Um, but I mean, he ha maybe he, it looks like he's just shaving individual numbers because we kind of have seen every main deck card in the post board games. That sounds right to me. I think that's that's what Shane's up to here. But Shane gets the first play. Greg on the play just went mountain, mountain, mountain. No creatures. And Shane gets the first board presence with a turn three Hordling Outburst. And this may be the issue you were talking about with this mono red aggro deck. It's, you see a fifth land in Greg's hand. He has just played mountains for the first four turns. Yeah, we don't know what Greg's up to. He could have a lot of burn in his hand, of course. But but is that good enough? Can you just, can you just start playing burn spells on turn four and hope to win? From 20, probably not. It's like, yeah, you can go end step stoke your face, but that's... I'm not excited at all about that line. Well, I think that's where we're at, because... That's what he... Yeah, you see... You're not going to kill a token, so... Yep, all right, Shane. We're a fifth of the way there. He goes down to 16. Draw was another mountain from Greg. Maybe Shane's mold of five gets there. We'll see. Greg can deal four a turn with a Stoke the Flames, but Shane's dealing three a turn, and he doesn't have to spend cards to do it. Those are just goblin tokens. And if he ever senses weakness out of Greg, he has the option to pull in the trigger on a um, Jeskai Charm for plus one, plus one, and lifelink. Yep. And that could undo all of Greg's work if Greg is on this. I'm going to try to Stoke and just burn you out of this game. Well, not to mention Shane had a Stoke and Jeskai Charm of his own. So if we want to talk about who's winning this burn your face race, I think the answer is Shane. Yep. And, and Greg doing nothing on the fifth turn. Not on his turn, and not on Shane's turn. Plays a sixth mountain and passes. And this seems, I don't know what, I mean, a series of bad draws here for Greg. Well, I don't know what the keep is, but yeah, he has a seventh mountain in his hand. And this is the big cost of, uh, again, not having access to Muta Vault, these mono-colored aggressive lists. When you draw, every land that Greg is drawing here past the fifth one is just a dead draw or close to it. Now, he is getting a bit of a reprieve here because Shane's draw here is, you know, it's an aggressive start. And hostilities. And he's drawn back-to-back -back copies of end hostilities, yeah. which is about the best thing Greg could ask for here. Greg needs to draw a Jaws of Stone or something. That like, like, he needs a card that scales off lots of mountains. Yeah. Scales off... Like, you talk about Mizium Mortars being a, a, a more realistic example. That was a card that was around last season that Okay, at this point, if Greg had a Mizium Mortars in his hand, he'd be like, well, at least I can sweep your board. Exactly. Um, what is it? Cards Burst Lightning is a card that Mono Red decks really liked playing for that reason. Firebolt, most of the same thing. You know? Exactly. Things that can give can hedge against flooding are really valuable for yeah. uh, monocolor aggressive decks. Now, the one one of the cards that fulfills that role in standard right now for red decks is, is Fire Drinker Seder, but that's really hard to rationalize playing in the world of Raise the Alarm, Hordling Outburst, and if a million cheap removal spells. If he had them, he would have boarded them out. It's yeah. Titan Strength, the draw from Greg, and the, the pieces just don't seem to be... The deck, they aren't working together very well. You see a searing blood on one of the tokens there from Greg. The only thing that's saving Greg in this game is the fact that Shane's hand is just really weird right now. Yeah. Greg's at 8, Shane at 13. Shane with two 1-1s one -ones in play. A Jeskai Charm in hand. Greg's life is lower than he may think. Storm Breath Drag in the play. That gets around the Jeskai Charm in Shane's hand. Uh, it'll probably get an end hostilities. I think at this point, Shane should probably just Jeskai Charm Greg, untap, attack, Oh, oh, he's, he's got, he's got a dead. A second yeah, stoke. Greg will go to four. He's going to untap. And this should do it on a mall to five. Jeskai Charm. You see another stoke in Shane's hand, too. And that'll do it. Shane Boyd, despite the mall to five on the draw game three, takes it down, and he moves to 2-0 and with the Jeskai Tokens deck. And you got to see the value of Hordling Outburst against Dex with Spire Removal. We've seen a lot of that in Standard, of course, over the last couple weeks. Uh, probably starting with the Mardu deck, and we've seen it incorporated now into Jeskai Tokens and the Mono Red Aggro. Yeah. And 
Greg has barrage of boulders. I've been advocating arc lightning in the sideboard for mono red or you know red X builds for much the same reason. Uh, just things that are good against Harling Outbursts, I think people need to start incorporating in their deck because it's all over the place right now. Yeah, and I think it's it's hard to build a deck that beats Hordling Outburst and beats Siege Rhino because the answers to those cards are so different right yes, now. Yes, exactly. And that's the, uh, what I like about the format a lot is the threat answer dichotomy is really robust. And mm -hmm. certain cards are, are good against some of the threats and not against others. And it's made the metagame really fluid as a result.